Uh, thank you for an introduction. So this talk is on the um, power of combined basic LP and affine relaxations for promised CSPs. Uh, and this is joint work with Venkat Guraswamy at CMU, uh, Martin Rokna at um, Oxford, and Standa Zivni also at Oxford. So just to give a high level picture of what's going on, see, uh, constraint satisfaction problems are a very vast field um, and there's been a number of variants of CSPs that have been of interest for the last uh, couple decades. These include valued constraint satisfaction problems, counting constraint satisfaction problems, quantified constraint satisfaction problems, uh, or the topic of our talk today, promise constraint satisfaction problems. And there's even nowadays um, combining a couple of these like promise value constraint satisfaction problems and so on. So there's all these different rich uh, types, but, uh, and I'm also omitting quite a few such as random constraint satisfaction problems and others. But I'd really like to uh, emphasize today promise constraint satisfaction problems because they're rather, um, as you'll see there, they have a rather uh, fundamental importance uh, to this field. Okay. So the overall agenda of today's talk is gonna be to understand a simple principled algorithm for a broad class of promise CSPs. Uh, in particular, uh, what we're gonna first have is an overview of what promise CSPs are, as well as the most important tool for understanding promise CSPs, which are their polymorphisms. Uh, then we're gonna um, jump into some ways of a couple of algorithms for solving, uh, solving promise CSPs, which are the basic linear programming algorithm, as well as the um, affine relaxations of promise uh, CSPs. We'll give an analysis uh, for a particular class of promise CSPs. And we're also gonna characterize the power of these uh, promise CSPs. And then I'll have some concluding remarks which should help connect back um, the results of this talk to um, the broader uh, CSP, uh, the broader world of CSPs. Um, also feel free to, if you have a question to um, jump it in at any time. Um, if you want me to clarify anything. All right, so let's get started on the first one, uh, explaining what promise CSPs are. So let's just start with a, a quick refresher. So when we talk about a CSP, we have a set of variables which we'll call x, which will typically number um, x1 to xm. We're also gonna have a finite domain to which we'll assign the variables, which is, um, often zero one, although uh, this talk will apply to any finite domain. And we're also gonna have some relations, um, which are like subsets of uh, A to the K for some suitable K. Uh, a simple example of a relation would just be uh, one and three set where you allow uh, exactly, where you have uh, a three tuple and you allow exactly one of the three variables to be one. This collection is known as a relational structure, um, and we'll just use bold A to denote this relational structure. Um, okay. Uh, so from this, there are two different, there's sort of um, two major classes of notation that people use to discuss CSPs. I'll just give both for completeness. So let's just consider it a simple example of one in three set. Uh, one way is you can write down your CSP as like a formula. So for instance, we have like R of maybe some variables like X1, X2, X3, which just means this X1, X2, X3, these have to be um, an element of the domain uh, of the relation R um, and so forth. And this is gonna be a, a conjunction of all of these uh, conditions. Uh, the other major way you can write this is homomorphism style, where instead you create another relational structure X, which it, uh, bold X, which is your um, tuples of variables. And you ask if there's a homomorphism from this X 
to your original uh, constraints A. Uh, these two are completely equivalent. It's just, um, it's sort of a matter of the situation, which one's uh, more convenient. So a prom So that's all for uh, just CSPs. What's a promise CSP? A promise CSP um, consists of actually two structures, uh, A and B, which uh, have um, basically two versions of a relation, a strong relation and a weak relation. And the important property um, of this is that there's a homomorphism. Uh, if you think of like the domains A and B the same, you can think uh, a simple case would be this homomorphism would just be the inclusion of RA into RB. Uh, but you, there's a variety of other homomorphisms, uh, which I'll get to in some examples. But uh, this, uh, one way of looking at this is there's a decision problem, which is given two structures A and B, and your uh, template, uh, your, um, basically your formula X, or your um, variable structure X, you want to know if there's a homomorphism from X to A, or if there's no homomorphism from X to B. Note that because we said that there's a homomorphism from A to B, um, that if there's a homomorphism from X to A, there must also be a homomorphism from A to B. Thus, this is actually a proper promise problem. There's, um, there's some uh, middle, which uh, there's some middle ground, which we're not accounting for. Uh, another variant of promise CSPs, which is commonly studied, is called search promise CSPs, where I promise you that there's a, a homomorphism from X to A, and I want you to like find an explicit example of a homomorphism from X to B which is guaranteed to exist. Um, so definitely if you solve the search promise CSP problem, you'll also have an algorithm for the decision PS, uh, PCSP problem. But in general, um, having solving the decision PCSP problem doesn't solve the search PC, PCSP problem. We're gonna, uh, for this talk, we're gonna, focus on the decision uh, PCSP problem. So it's, in some sense, it's not gonna be the final word on some of these algorithms, uh, but extending them to the search domain is an interesting open question. Uh, I should also say as an important remark that ordinary CSPs are uh, captured by setting A equal to B. In this case, the homomorphism is just the identity map. And then the distinguishing whether there's a homomorphism from X to A or from X to not B is literally just does there exist a solution to a given CSP formula? Okay. Uh, any questions so far about the definitions of promise CSPs? I'll also go for a number of ex uh, examples now in, in case something's not clear. Okay. Let me start with the following example, which is uh, the classic approximate graph coloring problem. So, for instance, does there exist a three coloring of a graph X? Or, sorry, assume there exists a three coloring of a graph X. Can we find a five coloring in polynomial time? So, in this case, the way you would set it up is the domain of three coloring is one, two, three. The domain of five coloring is one to five. The relations are just um, on each domain, basically, the pairs i and j, which are not equal. And our inclusion sigma is just going to be the identity map, because a is a subset of b. In particular, any three coloring is also a five coloring. Uh, this is actually a very, um, although it's simple to state, the set problems are very non-trivial to analyze. And it was actually only because of the development of promise CSPs that we now know this was NP-hard as of last, last year. Uh, another example, which is actually um, one that sort of uh, kickstarted the field of promise CSPs, is this um, uh, AB sat, or also called like two plus epsilon sat, due to um, Ostrom, Guruswami, and Astad, which is you have some 
uh, B set formula. So you have a set formula in which every clause has B variables. And I promise this, there's an assignment in which at least A of the literals are satisfied. Okay, so it's not just, um, basically you have an over and above uh, structure on a satisfying assignment to this clause. And the goal is just to find an ordinary assignment. So the way that you can write this one is um, obviously the domain is Boolean. And the primary relation, which is this um, having these literals, is the set of clauses which sum to at least A versus the sum of literals which sum to at least one, or sum of uh, variables sum to at least one. And in particular, uh, we also have a second relation, which is this um, not uh, that one variable is the negation of the other. This is more of a technicality so that you can allow for negations of variables. So I can say that like A, A does not equal B. Notice it doesn't change. So even in the relaxed version, uh, variables which are specified to be negations are still negations. Um, you could also omit that entirely and just have a separate version of this uh, first R1 for every possible uh, combination of negations uh, you could have in, a, uh, in one of these clauses. And again, the uh, containment is just sigma i is equal to i. Uh, this has a polynomial time algorithm if and only if the ratio of a and b uh, is at least a half. And yeah, this was, uh, um, in some sense, the first result uh, uh, for the theory of uh, premises piece, uh, modular previous work that had come before on um, approximate graph coding. Okay. Uh, another example, which is sort of like a hypergraph generalization of approximate graph coloring, um, is called one and three set versus not all equal set. So in this case, uh, you have your uh, your strong relations are um, one and three set. So each clause has to have exactly one variable set to true, but the relaxed variables have um, each clause can have either one or two variables set to true. What's interesting about this is both one and three set and not all equal set are um, uh, MP hard by themselves. But when you uh, allow for this uh, promise structure, there's actually uh, many polynomial time algorithms to uh, solve this problem. And in some sense, uh, the goal of this talk is to give another algorithm uh, for this, uh, this problem. Uh, so those are just some a uh, few examples of promise CSPs. So in order to analyze uh, the structure of promise CSPs, um, a key property is to analyze is something called a, po a polymorphism. A polymorphism is essentially a way of combining solutions to get more solutions. Um, or more formally, imagine you have um, some function which takes uh, basically an L tuple from the uh, first formula A and then outputs uh, something from B. And the key property is that if I have, say, uh, some relation R, oh, sorry, that's a typo, that should be RB. Uh, if you have some satisfying assignments to um, RA, then when you combine them column-wise, you get a satisfying assignment to RB. So in particular, um, it's, it, it gives you like a, high dimensional symmetry of your problem or it, it tells you a way to combine solutions. Uh, let me just mention that like a trivial way that you can do this is you just output one of the original, uh, one of the rows. So if I just take a single one of the rows and output it um, and then so that it satisfies RB, you would apply to homomorphism sigma. But in, in essential, uh, essentially you would only just look at one of the rows this would be known as a projection or a dictator polymorphism. And these are rather um, 
and they're sometimes called like the, in some sense, the trivial polymorphisms of the problem. Uh, we'll give some examples soon of some non-trivial polymorphisms. Um, another way to think about this is you can just, you can take a suitable power of your structure A, and then you're looking at uh, homomorphisms from uh, A to the L to B. Uh, the set of all these polymorphisms together is called uh, Paul AB, and this will have the structure of what's known as a minion, which we'll um, discuss in more detail later in the talk. Is there any questions about the definition of a polymorphism? All right. So let me just give a couple examples. So in some sense, one of my favorite examples is two set. So imagine you have like the following two set formula. And let's say I have three solutions um, as follows. If you take the majority vote of the solutions, you'll actually get another solution to your problem. And you don't just have to take the majority vote of three solutions. You can actually take the uh, majority vote of any odd number of solutions and you'll get another solution. Um, sort of the contrasting example to two set is three set, where the only polymorphisms are the essentially unary operators, which are uh, basically I take uh, f of x is equal to xi. So these are also known as projections or dictators. Um, and in some sense, the, re the reason why three set is NP hard, whereas two set is easy, is that three set only has these essentially unary operators, whereas two set has these uh, rich polymorphisms. Uh, just to give um, a couple more examples, uh, let's say you had some linear equations, say um, ax equals to b. If you have three solutions to ax equal to b, then if I take, say, x1 minus x2 plus x3, this is also a solution to your linear system. So in particular, the function which takes uh, three inputs and outputs um, a, b, c, and outputs a minus b plus c, is a polymorphism of this problem. And in fact, you could take any um, odd number of solutions, uh, x1 minus x2 plus x3 minus x4 plus x5 and so on, and these would also be polymorphisms. Uh, for this uh, other promise CSP I alluded to earlier, one in three set versus not all equal three set, there's a very special polymorphism known as alternating threshold which is sort of the Boolean variant of these uh, linear equation operators, where you dis basically take an alternating sum of x1 minus x2 and so on, and then I threshold whether you're at least one or at most zero. And this is actually a polymorphism of this problem. And it's also an example of what's known as a block symmetric polymorphism. So if I uh, take the e odd indices and I permute the inputs, uh, at the odd indices, it doesn't change. If I take the even inputs and I permute the indices, it also doesn't change, or permute the inputs, it doesn't change. So in particular, we can partition the input into two blocks, such that when you permute each of these blocks, uh, you don't change. So this is what's known as a block symmetric polymorphism, and these will be important later on. So um, the big picture of polymorphisms is what's known as sort of a Galois connection. Um, there's stronger versions of this statement, but this is all we need for this talk, is that if you have some polymorphism AB is a subset of some polymorphism uh, CD, then in some sense, the promise CSP from CD is easier than the promise CSP AB. In, in particular, there's a relevant log space reduction. Uh, there's much more uh, complicated things you can say, or um, not so much complicated. There's other things you can uh, say, for instance, if there's what's known as a minion homomorphism or more complicated structures, but even just subset uh, gives you the idea that having more polymorphisms, if you have more, a richer family of polymorphisms, then you're much more likely to be, um, have uh, like a polynomial time algorithm. In particular, there's this, the high level picture I want to give is that if you have your polymorphisms are very symmetric, so like things like 
majority or alternating threshold where there are many symmetries going on. There aren't, um, no coordinate uh, is determining the outcome, then your problem's tractable. And if it's sort of more skewed, as in um, there's a, your output only depends on one coordinate or a small number of coordinates, or there's some way of looking at the polymorphism so that it only depends on a small number of coordinates, then it's MP hard. This is definitely oversimplifying the picture, but this is sort of a good rule of thumb to decide like whether you should have a polynomial time algorithm or if you should be MP hard. Uh, if you were at uh, Labor's talk um, last month on Prom CSPs, uh, he mentioned, uh, he, he gave like a rich criterion for just deciding if your um, promise CSP is MP hard. In some sense, we're going to do the reverse uh, in this talk, which was we're going to give a set of criterion such that if your promise CSP satisfies this criterion, then you have a polynomial time algorithm. Uh, and before I jump into the main results, let me just uh, give some example, uh, just some prior work. So I already mentioned this two plus epsilon set work of um, Ashton Guru, Swami, and Astad. There's also um, some work on getting a dichotomy for uh, basically binary symmetric relations. So what that means is you have a uh, a binary, a Boolean domain, or a, yeah, sorry, I should say Boolean, uh, not binary. Um, you have a Boolean domain, and every relation has the property that if I permute the inputs, uh, uh, whether, you're in, whether you are in the relation does not change. Uh, Venkat and I were able to give a dichotomy if you have the assumption that you uh, allow for negation, so you have this not relation in your family. And then um, just last year, it was extended to a full dichotomy. Uh, there's all very things. So like, for instance, if you have polymorphisms, which are known as threshold periodic, which captures some things like um, uh, majority and other things like that, then you can actually have a polynomial time algorithm. Um, and there's also some recent work which generalizes two plus epsilon set to um, higher arity domains. So there's quite a few uh, algorithmic works in this space. Uh, well, a number of these give both algorithms and hardness. And what I wanna say is of these papers, we actually supersede the algorithmic results uh, for essentially all of them. Okay. So yeah, just to give you a high level again, we're gonna try to give like a principled algorithm for understanding a broad class of premise CSPs. Uh, I just gave a refresher on what promise CSPs and their polymorphisms are. And now we're gonna um, uh, jump into some actual algorithms. Um, are there any questions at this point about just promise CSPs in general? Okay. Okay, and uh, just to recap, a promise CSP has uh, two structures A and B, which have strong relations and weak relations. Uh, and we want to distinguish being basically being able to satisfy a formula using uh, the strong structure versus having no solution for the weak structure. So think like three coloring versus not being five coloring. Uh, so during this, uh, I'm not going to write out these relaxations and other things I do in full generality. Instead, I'll just write them out for this one in three set versus not equal set uh, problem where you have, um, yeah, one in three set and then you have not equal three set. Okay, so let's get into our first relaxation, which is the basic linear programming relaxation. The high level idea here is we're going to assign a probability distribution to each variable in class. So in particular, uh, since we're assuming Boolean, we're gonna give each variable a probability distribution on zero and one. So basically we'll have two variables, PI of zero, PI of one, such that PI of zero plus PI of one is equal to one. We'll also have a clause uh, for each clause, 
we're going to have a probability distribution on its assignments. So we'll have 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, uh, be non negative and sum to 1. Notice we're only going to um, encode the clauses of the strong version A. Actually, B doesn't show up at all in the relaxation. We're just going to prove that if, to, if we can solve the relaxation, then we've actually solved B. And then um, between the clause probability distributions and variable distributions, we're going to have uh, basically marginal consistency checks. So for instance, P1, uh, the probability that P1 is equal to 0 is equal to the probability you have 0, 1, 0, or 0, 0, 1. Uh, and the probability you're 1 is the probability you get 1, 0, 0. Okay? And we'll just have a list of these checks. So obviously, if you have a complicated formula, you're going to have a lot more. Um, uh, I'm omitting quite a few clauses, but uh, you're going to have uh, every uh, equation you can write of this type will be your re relaxation. And this is what's known as the basic linear programming relaxation. Um, and by using a, a certain algorithm, such as the ellipsoid algorithm, you can find a solution over to rationals in polynomial time. So let me jump in uh, to affine equations. So uh, I'm writing this up uh, sort of in a very specific way, which is we're basically going to do the exact same thing, except every time where we said probability distribution, we're now going to say like, oh, we're going to assign integers. Uh, so we're no longer going to um, assign that uh, the variables are non-negative. So these can definitely go uh, be negative. But otherwise, they're exactly the same. So we're going to have some variables like uh, QIs for the variables, which sum to 1. So for instance, like 3 and negative 2, something like that. And for each clause, we're going to have variables which sum to 1. So this is going to represent like your um, satisfying assignment being like an affine combination. So it's going to, this will capture things like linear equations which the uh, basic linear program by itself cannot capture. And again, we're going to have a, basically sort of like an affine distribution for each variable, an affine distribution for each clause. And then we're going to have some consistency checks, which tell you if um, that the, the marginals you get for each zero and one are the same. Okay. It, it looks a little funny for um, affine equations, but if you have this intuition of probabilities, and then I'm just going to say, oh, instead of probabilities, I'm going to have integers, then this roughly makes sense. And by an algorithm due to Kahneman and Bacham, you can uh, actually find a solution in polynomial time. Okay, so the talk uh, was about basically the combined BLP plus affine algorithm. So, all right, let's give it. Well, we're going to run the basic LP algorithm. So we're going to write down this linear program. We're going to check if there's a rational solution. Reject if no solution. We're going to write. We're going to write down the affine um, algorithms. So we're going to write down this affine relaxation. See if there's a solution over the integers. Reject if there's no solution. And if we pass both of those checks, we'll accept. Notice we're not outputting a solution. Actually, we're not even touching B at all, uh, the, the, the structure B at all. We're only working at the structure A. But this is actually, an, um, the, in some sense, we're just solving the decision problem. So this is fine. Uh, I should say that what I said has a subtle error. Uh, this is not correct. This is not what we write in the paper. Uh, but to motivate the issue we had to uh, go around, in some sense is also the primary, one of the primary things that distinguishes the, the algorithm uh, we're going to give versus the previous literature, uh, because actually both of these algorithms already appear in a couple of our papers, uh, will motivate it by trying to prove things work and seeing that we fail. <laughs> Okay, so those are sort of the two algorithms, and now we're going to jump into an analysis. Uh, before that, is there any questions about 
what I mean by like a basic linear programming relaxation or an affine relaxation. Okay. So now in our analysis, we're gonna jump into uh, talking about polymorphisms. And just to recap, polymorphisms are ways of combining solutions to get another solution. And this is actually gonna be pretty important the way we use it in the analysis. We're going to basically, what we're gonna do is we're gonna sort of construct a bunch of solutions to our problem RA, or they're gonna be partial solutions. And we're gonna use the polymorphism to combine them to get partial solutions to RB. But what we're gonna show is that all this, the solutions to all the R, every clause for RB is actually consistent. So it's actually a solution for the whole thing. So uh, I actually haven't said the main theorem, or actually this isn't quite the main theorem, but uh, this is a uh, part of the main result, which is the BLP plus affine algorithm correctly solves PCSP AB if the polymorphism has infinitely many symmetric polymorphisms. Uh, so a polymorphism is symmetric uh, if for all permutations pi, uh, the output doesn't change. So as this equation down here shows, uh, you can also write, there's also a couple of notations for talking about applying a permutation. So this will also apply for block symmetric, which I'm going to, uh, which I mentioned earlier, like this alternating threshold where you actually partition the um, variables into blocks. and um, within each block you're symmetric. But uh, for simplicity, I'm just gonna talk about symmetric polymorphisms for most of the talk. All right, so let's do a first attempt at the proof where we're only gonna use the basic linear program. So let's assume our polymorphism has infinitely many symmetric polymorphisms. And we're gonna pick some L so we're gonna solve our linear program and we're gonna pick an L sufficiently large uh, such that you have some big symmetric polymorphism. Uh, I, I should also say I'm slightly oversimplifying. I'm using one and three set as my example, but I'm using a symmetric operator. Uh, the proof for uh, block symmetric is very similar, just a bit more notation. So I'm just simplifying it on the slide. So let's, let's take one of our clauses, say RA of x1, x2, x3, and let's take some uh, solutions. So let's say L is five. We have these uh, five uh, solutions. So we'll have like maybe one, zero, zero, one, zero, 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 one, one. Okay, and we're gonna set them so that they're roughly proportional to the number of copies. So basically if I gave weight W100, to uh, this distribution one zero zero, I'm gonna give that much weight. And I'm just gonna scale this up by L. Okay, and um, I'll do that for one zero zero, one zero zero, zero one zero, zero zero one, and so on. And the idea is if I combine these with the polymorphism, because the polymorphism is symmetric, it only depends on the output on the proportion of zeros and ones in each column. But by exactly because of how we set up our basic LP, the uh, proportion of zeros and ones in each column is, is in, in some sense exactly the same for every, every clause because we had these uh, marginal consistency constraints that the probability distributions over the variables is equal to the probability distributions over the clauses, um, if you look at them in the right way. So in particular, even though we just output a solution for a single clause, we'd output the same solution for every clause. Um, yeah, so, so this is what you'd hope to work, but there's a big problem here, which is, by doing this, I'm assuming that L times W, uh, each of these Ws is an integer. In particular, L is a multiple of, or um, multiple of the least common denominator of all the um, rational numbers in your LP. 
And this is uh, too much to ask for, because for instance, it's, it, it could easily happen that, uh, for instance, if you're looking at maybe two sat and you have majorities, you have majorities of all odd arities. So L has to be an odd number, but it might very well be that your uh, Ws have even denominators. So this is no good. This, this actually um, will not work in this situation. Uh, and actually, uh, let me show you ex uh, a very explicit example of this. So we have um, two set, look at just the two set formula in which you have basically all four versions of the clause. So obviously you uh, can't solve uh, all these at once because the, each of them excludes one thing, so there's nothing to do. But there's a BLP solution. You have like P1 of zero, P, basically you put a 50-50 distribution on each of them, uh, and, but your weights have these one halves. So, so as I was mentioning, because these are even, an even denominator, we can't actually get them to be integers. So one thing you could hope to do is round, round the solutions. Uh, but actually, as you can, as because this doesn't have a solution, there's no way you could possibly do the rounding to make everything consistent. But um, another reason I want to bring up this counterexample is it actually has an even bigger problem. The BLP plus alpha in algorithm I gave doesn't uh, actually uh, passes for this formula. I can, I can also give you an affine solution to this clause. So I'll give, basically I'll put the integer zero for the assignment zero. I'll put the integer one for the assignment one. And then I'll put um, the, and then there's this, you can put a certain distribution on each of the clause distributions. So this is actually pretty bad. Because so, so what this is basically saying is, even for a problem as simple as two set, for which there's been many algorithms over the years, this BLP plus an algorithm can't even solve that. So the the major problem here, or the, the main observation, is if you look at this BLP solution, I put half. Uh, look at like say the first clause. I put half weight on one zero and zero one but I put no weight at all on this assignment one one. Thus, we can actually throw out one one from this clause and we'll instead get the clause uh, x one does not equal x two. This is known as, uh, in general, this is known as refinement where I solve the basic linear program. I throw out things that are assigned to zero and then I um, basically get a, a some sense of simpler uh, problem. Now, if you, uh, if you look at these uh, not equals, uh, it turns out if you would run the affine algorithm on this refinement, you will actually find a contradiction. It will reject, um, which was basically our general algorithm. In the next slide, well, so our algorithm is we'll run the basic LP algorithm for A, and we're gonna reject if there's no solution. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna do our refinement. We're gonna throw out things that don't have weight zero. You have to be a little bit careful. It, it's not just that there doesn't exist. Uh, there's some subtle details of with which things you throw out because just having weight zero for some solution isn't enough. It has to have weight zero for every solution. But um, I, you can see the full paper for some details on that. And then once you have this refinement, you run the affine algorithm and reject if no solution. Okay, so I wanna say that this refinement idea is probably the key distinguishing factor of the algorithm presented in this paper versus um, some of these upper papers, older papers. So now let's do um, sort of a quote, uh, correct analysis. What we're gonna do is essentially, um, we're gonna do essentially the same thing, but if you uh, look down here at the table, we're gonna pick, our, we're gonna pick an integer m, which is a multi, uh, multiple of uh, all the denominators. So m times w is an, is an actually proper integer. 
for um, all w's. But because we're going to pick some l that's such that a polymorphism exists, but this um, this l might not be a multiple of m. It could be a prime, or large prime, or something. So what we're going to use is we're going to use the n. We're going to have n be l minus m. This is sort of our deficit. And we're going to use the uh, affine solution r to uh, correct, do a correction. So we're going to do m times w plus n times r. And if you uh, do the math, because uh, we had that the sum of the w's has to be 1 and the sum of r's has to be 1, the whole thing is going to add up to l. So this will actually work. Do you actually have an integer number of things? Uh, the only thing you have to check is that in each row, you're actually, or sorry, each of these mw plus nrs is actually non-negative. And the reason that is, is if w is positive, then we'll have some slack. So if, if, we, if we pick n sufficiently small compared to m, uh, we'll have a little bit of margin to pick r such that whether r is positive or negative, this thing's still non-negative. And then the key thing is that if w is 0, let's say w is 0, then r must also be 0, because we said that we threw it out of our relaxation. In our refinement, we threw out the anything with w equal to 0, so r will also be 0. So in particular, that will also be non-negative. So this, this will all work. And because of our consistency equations, we'll know that our, uh, when we apply the polymorphism to each column, we'll actually get a consistent assignment to everything. This is, this is the heart of the, um, the argument. Uh, and this is, in some sense, probably the trickiest uh, part of the talk. So if there's any questions about this, uh, please ask. OK, um, just to sort of uh, say it one more time, the idea is before uh, L wasn't necessarily a multiple of the denominators, so L times W was not an integer, so you had to do some weird rounding. So now we can sort of, basically, we're doing the rounding properly by multiplying these Ws in a way so that they're, you actually get an integer. And then you're doing a correction term based on these affine equations. OK, so that's the analysis of the algorithm. But now what we want to know is what is, um, how powerful is this algorithm? Would, did we actually characterize all the, pro, uh, all the promised CSPs for which this algorithm solves? Or is there like uh, other promised CSPs for which you could actually uh, look at, other promised CSPs that we're missing? And it turns out uh, there's the following theorem. Uh, BLP plus affine correctly solves this uh, a promise CSP if and only if the polymorphisms have infinitely many block symmetric polymorphisms of two blocks. So uh, actually, as an interesting uh, corollary of this, uh, we, we were able to show that the algorithm works for any promise CSP with a block symmetric polymorphisms of any number of blocks. Uh, we only showed on the slides one block, but it also works with two, three, and so on. And it turns out any of these, for any of these problems, you actually have block symmetric polymorphisms of two blocks. So this is actually a rather non-trivial um, fact about minions, which I don't think was known before. Uh, or, uh, yeah. So the heart of this um, theorem is there's sort of an algebraic characterization of when it works, which is there's a, there's a minion, which we'll call BLP plus affine. We'll define it on the next, uh, next couple slides, which tells you, uh, and there's this also this thing called a minion homomorphism, such that if there is such a minion homomorphism from this uh, object, to uh, Paul A B, um, then you have um, then the algorithm correctly solves, and this is an inter infinite only f. So what's really cool is this is like a 
succinct algebraic uh, representation of when the BLP plus FI algorithm works. So let me just uh, say, I mentioned minions before, but let me just define it formally now. We say that a minor um, F, uh, so let's say we have, um, sorry, we have some polymorphism F, a minor of it, G, has the property that there's a map uh, pi uh, from one to L prime to one to L, such that if I plug in inputs from L prime, you get F on inputs from uh, pi applied to those. So for instance, uh, uh, oh, sorry, this should be, sorry, just a second. Uh, sorry, the map should be going the other way, my bad. Uh, but, uh, or, or sorry, no, no, no. Uh, yes, sorry, the, the map should be going from L to L prime, my bad. So if there's a function from X1 to XL, which is equal to um, F. So uh, another way to think about this is there's a way to like contract the coordinates. So for instance, if I have like a majority on maybe 100, maybe like 99 variables, and I can set every three variable consecutive variables equal, like break the variables into groups of three and set them to be equal, then I'll get a minor on 33 variables. Uh, that's the main idea that's trying to be captured by this. Um, and then the idea is a minion is a collection of functions which are closed under minors. And a minion homomorphism is a map uh, which preserves uh, arity and commutes of minors. So basically the idea is each function in a class of functions has an arity, the number of uh, variable, it, variables it has as input, the number of coordinates. And this minion homomorphism needs to preserve arity, but it also needs to commute with these minors. So if I take a, take a relevant minor, then I'll also get, uh, before I take the homomorphism, I'll also take a homomorphism. Um, an important fact is that the polymorphisms of AB is always a minion. And in fact, if there is um, uh, a minion homomorphism from one set of polymor uh, from one pole AB to pole CD, then you also have a, a relevant polynomial time reduction. So in our case, uh, the minion that we care about is what's known as the BLP plus FI minion. Uh, there's a few ways to define this. Uh, since I'm, you actually can define this without using functions at all, but uh, I'll, I'll just use it with uh, functions. It's functions from, uh, let's say, rational numbers, takes L rational numbers to um, uh, Sorry, uh, there's also a slight typo here. This should also just be to the, uh, this should be to the rational squared, where um, when you take the functions, you get w1 uh, x1 plus wl xl is equal to r1 x1 to rl xl. Uh, so the w's, so, sorry, uh, the typo is that the w should be in uh, uh, non-negative rationals and the r should be integers. And you have the property that if you plug in all, all ones into this f, you get one comma one. So the sum of the wi's is equal to one. The sum of the ri's is equal to one. And then the following important property, which corresponds to the re refinement that we talked about before, is that if some wi is equal to zero, we must also have that ri is equal to zero. Um, Yes, so yeah, uh, sorry about that. The WIs are non-negative rationals and the RIs are um, 
integers. The important uh, fact here is that BLP plus affine correctly solves PS, uh, the problem is CSP if and only if there is one of these uh, minion homomorphisms from BLP plus affine to the polymorphisms of A and B. So in particular, there's essentially, um, there's sort of a copy of this minion um, inside of the polymorphisms of A and B. And the Fira, um, and if you know the Fira, you almost immediately get the cor corollary to BLP plus alpha and solves PSCSP AB, if and only if Paul AB has infinitely many block symmetric polymorphisms of two blocks. And the reason you get this corollary is that one thing that always works is you can take WI is equal to, take L to be odd, WI to be one over L, and then the ris to be minus one, uh, basically alternating plus and minus one. This sort of corresponds to the alternating threshold that we uh, showed before. And this is going to be block symmetric. Because um, if I permute the even coordinates or the odd coordinates, we'll actually get uh, polymorphic. Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, the output is preserved. And because um, when you have a minion homomorphism, that means there's sort of a copy of, of this function inside Paul of AB, which means there's another function in Paul of AB with the same arity L, which has these exact properties, or has this exact property uh, with permutations of coordinates. Um, so because of time, I don't, I, I can't say much ab uh, about the proof, but there are a number of similar ideas. So for instance, if you, if there does exist a, this uh, homomorphism, then you have these many symmetric homo, uh, polymorphisms. So the algorithm we presented earlier is enough. And sort of the big idea is if the algorithm works, then you, you need to be, you can identify within the polymorphisms uh, structure that behaves a lot, that there must be some structure inside the polymorphisms that is behaving well with both the um, basic linear programming combination, uh, basic linear program and the affine relaxation. And this, um, uh, the structure can be, uh, if you look at the structure, you can uh, pull out of it uh, sort of using um, uh, some sort of like a infinite tree type argument to uh, actually extract out, uh, you can actually build the, hum uh, sorry, the homomorphism uh, explicitly. Okay, so this was, um, so just to give a recap so far, we've discussed what promise CSPs are. We've given the algorithms that we did. We uh, gave an analysis. We discussed the power of these uh, promise CSPs. And now let's just give a couple of concluding remarks. So one nice result is that you can actually, um, you sort of get an all-in-one algorithm for Schaefer's theorem. So um, Schaefer's theorem says that any tractable Boolean CSP has one of the following polymorphisms. Uh, so there's like a list of six of them, which I can show. Uh, like you have uh, the constant zero, the constant one, or of two bits, and of two bits, majority of three bits, or X or three bits. Now a key property about CSPs is that because the input domain and the output domain of the polymorphism are the same, you can actually bootstrap polymorphisms to get more polymorphisms. So for instance, if you know constant zero is a polymorphism, you can actually get that constant zero of all arities as a polymorphism. Or if you have the or of two bits, you actually have the or of all arities, or the, um, if you have majority of three bits, this one's a bit more non-trivial, but you can get the majority of all odd, er of, sorry, uh, sorry, let's just say odd, of all odd arities. If you have the XOR of three bits, you can get the XOR of all odd arities. So in particular, um, by looking at this, we can actually solve all of these in a single algorithm because all of these are symmetric families of polymorphisms. So, yeah. Um, uh, um, okay. 
yeah, I think that's all I have to say about that. Uh, another thing you might wonder is, okay, great, you can solve Schaefer's dichotomy. Can you do the full Boolean dich of the full CSP dichotomy? Uh, and the answer is no, uh, due to uh, Jakob graciously uh, 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 shared this example. So imagine you uh, have a domain of size five, uh, zero to four, and you have the following relation, which is uh, 0, 1, 1, 0, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 2. So here it is as a graph. So basically, you're, it's like a di directed graph homomorphism. If I give you a directed graph, is there a homomorphism to this? Or another way to think of it is, is every, does every component, connected component of a graph, directed graph, have a uh, have basically either a two coloring, or does it have basically like a three cycle coloring? And it turns out that this uh, problem CSP, so it's actually not even, a, it's not just a problem CSP, it's an actual CSP. Uh, it doesn't have symmetric or block symmetric polymorphisms of any area. That said, it does have cyclic polymorphisms of every prime area. Or, uh, maybe so, a very sufficiently large primarity. And it has, uh, in particular, it can be solved in polynomial time by doing like uh, Shirali Adams uh, lift of the basic linear program. So this kind of leads into what do I think about the future of promise CSPs? So I kind of see that there's two ways you can go here. Uh, one is there's a number of existing algorithms for CSPs or that we don't really know the power of them. So for instance, there's these bounded width algorithms due to, um, which were fully characterized for CSPs by uh, Barto and Kozik. But there's also uh, uh, Shirali Adams, Blasser hierarchies. Um, also uh, these recent processes P papers show the power of adding in some affine relations into these hierarchies. So what happens when you add those? What's the power of those? Uh, there's also the general Bulatov and uh, Zhuk algorithms for um, CSPs in general. And it would be nice to understand like what connections these have to promise CSPs. Can we generalize these to classes of promise CSPs? Do they work in some capacity with promise CSPs? Um, these would be interesting to know. We'd also like to, uh, thinking about the polymorphisms themselves, there's also very interesting classes. For instance, instead of these fully symmetric where you're using all permutations, imagine you only have cyclic permutations, which is like the example on the previous slide. That would be amazing. It would actually, if you could solve this case, you'd already supersede uh, Bulatov and Shuk. There's also transitive symmetric, and I think there's others you can come up with that would be interesting classes to understand. Um, and then also the even bigger picture, which is closing the gaps between algorithms and hardness. Like much is still open for hardness as uh, Libor's talk showed. And it would be um, cool if we could eventually uh, uh, sh meet in the middle at some, some point in the future, although that still looks quite a ways off in general. But perhaps something like Boolean promise CSPs, this is a, a feasible target. All right, and that's it. Uh, uh, special thanks to Libor, Andre, and Jakob for uh, valuable uh, comments or valuable help throughout. Okay, thank you, Josh. Um, thanks for a nice talk. Any questions for Josh, please? Right, okay, yeah. then maybe I can, can ask a couple of questions first. Uh, sure. So in your theorem, you wanted um, symmetric polymorphism with, with two blocks, but I guess you want to exclude the case when one of the blocks is, is very small and the other is... Uh, oh, yes, yeah. So, so, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I forgot to mention that, yeah. Uh, you need the, yes, you can always have um, one of the blocks be very small. So for instance, a dictator has, I guess, technically two blocks uh, one of which is just a single coordinate. Yes, I, I meant to say um, uh, both blocks are arbitrarily large. All right. 
or, or uh, you have two blocks which are the same, uh, almost the same size, right? Yeah. Current one. Yeah, actually you can get, uh, just from this, uh, from the homomorphism, you can actually get that the two blocks are off by one. So they're literally as close as possible to each other. Okay, thanks. So my, my other question is this. So you, you did a refinement from a, a BLP to a fine. Can you do the refinement the other way? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so if you, uh, I haven't, I'm a little bit worried um, in that case. So the reason I feel like the answer is no, because, because uh, if you go back to here, what would happen uh, if you did the refinement the other way? What are you What are you saying? You're throwing out things which have value equal to zero. I, I, I presume that's what you would mean by refinement. If you If you If you can set it equal to zero, throw it out. Uh, that would be fine. But then the problem is, wait, actually, is that a problem? Oh, sorry. The problem is, is you could still have negative uh, solutions to your affine. So like imagine your affine gave some variable a negative value, but then when you solve the basic linear program, you got zero for the W. So then you would have M times zero plus N times a negative number, and that's negative. So the reduction won't okay. work in that case. There might be a way to uh, play around with things, but I feel like once you start playing around, you're essentially going to come back in this situation. Um, also, I guess by dominion homomorphism, I feel like it is that that order of quantification is because it's equivalent. I feel like it's your it, it is the right way to yeah to think about. It. Okay. Um, any more questions for Josh, please? Hello. Can you hear me? Oh, hi, Labor. Uh, hi, yeah, sorry for joining late. I'm somehow in a car uh, on a vacation. So uh, just a question. So you have these, uh, uh, these uh, two blocks or many blocks, which are totally mm -hmm. symmetric. And then as an open problem, you say like infinitely many cyclic, which is uh, kind of optimistic. At, at least it includes CSPs. Do you see anything in the middle somehow? Like, you know, what else could be tractable and maybe easier to, to tackle now? Yeah, actually, I was, uh, while making the talk, I was thinking about this. I was it's kind of s struggling to think about this. Um, I mean, maybe a simple, maybe this is too easy, but just something that comes off the top of my head is like, the symmetric group has like even permutations and odd permutations. Right. Yeah. So maybe, I, I actually don't know uh, off the top of my head, if you only have the even mm. symmetric group. Oh, that might actually be block symmetric then. I'd have to, uh, no, 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 actually it won't because that would still be, you'd have odd permutations there. Yeah, so even something something like that, although there's a huge, because the symmetric group isn't, I guess, what's the word, solvable? There, there's kind of a, um, I kind of struggle, like once you even throw in like cyclic plus like maybe a one over identity, it can quickly grow into the whole symmetric group. So you have to be a little bit careful when Right. Deciding which identities to throw in, but I, I do think there probably are some interesting intermediate cases, or even just solving it in the Boolean case because Boolean's symmetric, a uh, Boolean cyclic. There's, I mean, Schaefer's dichotomy right. theorem is known, so there's there's no CSP barrier mm -hmm. to overcome. Mm -hmm. I think that might be the correct problem to think about. Right. Thanks. <laughs> That's right. Um, any more questions for Josh, please? I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Katerina. Can you hear me? Hi. Um, did you think about combining the BLP with uh, um, other kind of relaxations and uh, over the integers? Because so my feeling is that uh, so when you talk about the analysis, uh, in the end, do you want to have like probability distributions on the uh, possible assignment, right, in the, in the structure A? Um, yeah. And uh, the, the, I mean, the, 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 the fine part is an is a integer number, which is uh, 
which can be negative. And the reason it works is because, I mean, you use the, the, the contribution of the fine part only to, like, to, to normalize the, the number that you, that you obtain, I mean, the coefficient that you obtain from the BLT. And uh, is it, does it make sense to consider a correct station only, uh, I mean, where the variable takes values over the um, positive integers? And oh, I see. I mean, um, maybe. Oh, oh, sorry. Like uh, maybe trying to to do some kind of refinement that makes it work. Yeah. So um, there's actually a slightly different approach which I um, brushed over in this talk, but um, there's a previous paper of. Uh, Mine and Venkat's, which uh, does, uh, so you, instead of doing a relaxation over to rationals over to integers, uh, you do a relaxation over Z, uh, what's, what's it called Z join root two. Mm -hmm. So you actually set each, so basically you solve the, what do you do? You, so if you go back to the basic LP, um, you go back to the basic LP and you add an additional constraint that instead of being rational numbers, they're actually in the ring, uh, in the ring Z adjoint root two. And this, this actually also um, works. So actually when this was, this was proposed in a different paper and it was only until this paper that we realized that the, uh, that approach actually also uh, does all uh, symmetric or block symmetric polymorphisms. So, so uh, there's a way you can do that to also um, uh, get things to work. Um, and so in that kind of, so in some sense you're getting like integer like things with um, that are where you are allowed to specify that you're non-negative. Um, it, it, it isn't quite as simple though as, um, uh, sadly it's not quite as simple as uh, you still have to do some work to get integer values to plug into like this this uh this table here, but it is another approach that's viable. I I'm also fairly sure that just solving a linear equation over at integers uh, ultimately is not going to be the most general thing you can do. Um, but I okay. I'm not aware of uh, I'm not aware of at the time what at this time like what is the what's the correct algebraic relaxation. I I feel like on the yeah I. I'd, I guess that's what I have to say. Okay, can I, can I ask you also what is your guess about the, so do you think that, uh, um, when you think about a combination of the Shirali Adam um, and uh, the affine relaxation, uh, what is your intuition? Do you, do you consider some uh, general, I mean, because my intuition is that, that you combine the, the Shirali Adams with the same, uh, hierarchy level of the affine relaxation is at least or you think it is going to work also with I mean like take the the, the Shirley Adams solution and refine the, the affine relaxation with respect to this solution with the affine. Uh sorry uh sorry is the question sorry is the question I, I, what, what? I'm, my question is do you think that uh, the Shirley Adam uh, needs to be combined with the uh, same hierarchy level of the, the fine relaxation or because of the refinement, it doesn't matter. So you take- Oh, the, the, I see. I see. Um, well, I guess for the refinement to sort of, I feel like for the refinement to be fully used, you would want the affine relaxation to be the same hierarchy level or else you're throwing away information you got from the refinement or actually is that true? True. Yeah, because you'd also have distributions, because you would add in a clause. I, I'm thinking of Shirali Adams. It's like you would throw in an additional clause for every, basically the tr uh, trivial clause for every um, subset of like k variables, and then you would um, you would sort of solve the. Uh, I guess you would essentially be solving the basic LP on that, and then you would solve then you would refine it and do the affine. So I guess it's the same level, I guess is what I had in mind. Okay. It is an interesting open question, like how many levels do you need? Like, I, I think it's known for CSPs, like 
uh, at least for the basic linear program, how many levels it, like three levels or something, or maybe it's two levels or three levels. It's, it become, you don't get any more power out of it, but I don't share anything like that's known for promising piece. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Katerina. Any more questions? No, no, thank you. That's okay. You. Uh, well, somebody else. Well, if there are no no more questions for Josh, then uh, I guess we can thank him um, somehow virtually. Uh, <laughs> Thanks for letting me speak. Yeah. Thanks, Josh. Um, and you will be notified about the uh, the next meeting of uh, of our seminar. Uh, I'll say um, that you can uh, find the paper on archive uh, if you're uh, interested in reading it. It's uh, you can also um, I'll make sure that these slides, uh, maybe with some of the typos corrected, uh, be uh, put on the I guess either the. YouTube or my website, wherever it's, uh, I can post these. Okay.